the acreage and footprint of the seaport is significantly larger compared to the seaport even 20 years ago. In 2006, the Oakland Army Base land transfer, which commenced in 2003 and which was completed in 2006, added approximately 184 acres to the Oakland seaport footprint to provide goods and movement logistic facilities. But even before the acquisition of former Ar Oakland Army Base in 1999, the port acquired 531 acres of the former Fleet and Industrial Supply Center for the Navy. So the Oakland Seaport added a total of 716 acres in the past 20, 40, 25 years and within the lifetime of my professional career, a more, of, more than doubling of the seaport footprint. Prior to even the military transfers and before the port also built the 7th Street Peninsula where another terminal stands today in its historic migration of the port from the east to the west. Like I mentioned before, the original port acreage at the founding of the port was more the shelter reaches of the inner harbor area of the estuary close to downtown Oakland in the area known as Jacqueline Square today. But the trend has been eastward. And you see the map again of the sort of evolution of the port. Let's also talk about volume because the seaport has, um, just as a seaport has evolved and grown in terms of the volume of cargo, the acreage has grown and frankly, the acreage has grown faster than our volume. Indeed, I appreciate that the BCC, DC staff has noted that, that one of the three decision factors for the day is not only acreage and growth projection, but the feasibility of using any port area for a particular seaport purpose. Among the factors that we're looking at the port is that investing in more effective and efficient use of our current capacity at 1300 acre footprint of the seaport. Let me give you one example. There are currently 120 acres available at the Outer Harbor Container Terminal that today is not actively being used for container port operations. On page 58 in the staff report, you really outline specifically what BCDC needs in the way of information. Um, specific and enforceable proposals to offset the loss of Howard Terminal if it were removed from Seaport Plan. And I didn't hear that in, in Danny's presentation um, and I didn't see it in the March 4th letter. So I just wanted to ask staff, have you received that kind of specific and enforceable proposal for comparable cargo terminals um, that could be added to BCDC's jurisdiction or, um, or acreage that could be added to the port's priority use area or, or guarantees um, on these productivity benchmarks so that um, something wouldn't be needed to replace Howard Terminal. Is it, have, you, have you received any of that um, that you requested or identified would be needed from the port? I can start um, uh, and then anyone else from staff can chime in. We haven't received any specific proposals for additional acreage or things of that nature. Um, we, you know, I think that March 4th letter was a great start by starting to address, you know, many of the comments that we have. Um, but no, we don't have a specific additional acreage proposed at this time. Okay. Um, I just wanted to be clear because I know it sounds like you've been asking for that for a long time and the port had a long time to provide that. Maybe there's reasons that the port can't make those kinds of commitments, but um, oh, that's that's what yeah, you uh, I just, outlined we needed um, anyway and it, it, per the seaport plan. And I'll just clarify that those were suggested ways that one could try to approach this problem in past um, uh the plan amendments, PUA removals, um, like the ones that have been mentioned, there have been sort of some of these swaps that have taken place. So we were simply referring to ways in the past that challenges like this have been addressed. Um, there's There could be other solutions though um, that um, we're very open to. Hearing. Okay, I understand. Uh, so my last clarifying question is just on, on page three of the staff report, um, you know, identifies Howard Terminal, um, 
in the, in the forecast as dormant or underutilized and and that was offered as a reason why it could potentially accommodate you know more of any of the three major types of cargo um, and then you mentioned also in the staff report the port's uh, announcement a couple of months ago about using Howard Terminal to address supply chain challenges. In fact, I saw a letter from the um, ag agricultural interests indicating how important it is uh, that the port has done that, using Howard Terminal more to improve um, agricultural export flow. So that would seem to indicate that Howard Terminal is actually not currently dormant and is being utilized. Is that correct? I can speak to that, David. Um, the, the kind of the definition that we're working with, and I should have explained it more clearly in my presentation of dormant or underutilized, is referring to like actually using um, that area as an active uh, marine terminal or cargo handling facility. And so those are the sites that were identified in the forecast as not doing that. It doesn't mean that there are no port related uses occurring on, a, on those sites. And in fact, and the port could speak to this in much greater detail than I could, but in many of those places that are identified as dormant or underutilized, there are ancillary services that exist in those places. Right, right. No, thanks for that clarification. I think that's really important because the terminology makes it seem like, um, well, I won't repeat that. Um, so just uh, anyway, to conclude what you said, how a terminal is, is apparently being, um, used now and needed for these ancillary uses, but some critical ones that help the port meet the current cargo needs. Not, not, it's not just the projected growth in cargo uh, as outlined in the cargo forecast, but that, that current activity. So um, thanks for that clarification. Even separate from that, the terminal improvements for RORO operations were found to be financially infeasible for the business opportunity. And this is, uh, yes, the, that is correct. Uh, if you look at Howard Terminal, uh, the high cost of any kind of rail improvements uh, into Howard Terminal would be uh, uh, already making it infeasible. But as we said, really, I think there's a sort of misunderstanding. We're not uh, with the turning basin using 10 acres of the Howard Terminal. That is a very highly needed, uh, according to the feasibility we're seeing, a highly needed terminal maritime use a maritime use that is highly desirable and needed today. So Howard Terminal will be used, put to use for maritime use in the future when the turning basin is expanded. So that's number one. With the turning basin cut into the berth, that berth space at Howard Terminal will be very, very limited for any kind of over the dock use. That's number two. And uh, I, I know that in the staff report, there was a graphic of sort of uh, superimposing the uh, Merit Richmond uh, Rural operation on top of Howard Terminal. Uh, that's what I mean when we talk about feasibility, which is one of the criteria that Corey presented. Is not only are we talking about just acreage and project the need, but we're also talking about feasibility is one of the major factors in this. Is it is it feasible? Uh, what's available at Richmond is not available at Howard. So it's simply superimposing that upon Howard Terminal is not indicative of whether it's feasible or not. Thank you. Uh, all right, I have one other hand uh, that's been up and down. Uh, Jimmy Triplett, are you still have a question, clarifying question? 